Hi, this is our series of orthopedic board review, and this is orthopedic trauma, the second lecture in the upper extremity. A good source that you can use in your study is this book written by myself. So we'll start with humeral shaft fracture in this lecture. As we know, uh, most of the cases of the humeral shaft fracture, they can actually be treated non-operatively. We start with coaptation splint, a splint that goes above uh, the uh, shoulder and um, around the elbow. Um, we use this for about one or two weeks, and then we shift to a fracture brace. Um, and we can expect that most fractures uh, will heal. So if you're giving scenario in your exam, uh, a middle aged patient with uh, a, a, a oblique fracture, spiral fracture, um, uh, isolated injury, what would be your treatment? So the treatment is coaptation splint followed by fracture uh, brace. Um, they may give you a little bit more difficult scenario. Um, a patient also same age group, um, you have a, a spiral fracture in the lower third, patient has a radial nerve palsy, what is the treatment? Same treatment as we're going to discuss later. Uh, it will be still non-operative coaptation splint followed by fracture brace. Um, we are going to speak um, uh, later about the relation of the radial nerve uh, to the uh, fracture humerus. Uh, uh, what about the hanging cast? Hanging cast, we uh, use hanging cast less often now than before. Uh, problem with hanging cast, uh, for it to work, the patient has to be either um, sitting or uh, standing. Uh, so the patient uh, will have, if you have a hanging cast, well, he will have to sleep um, uh, on like a, a recliner chair or a couch um, for the hanging cast to work. Um, and also when you assist the hanging cast, the x-ray has to be in the same thing, sitting or standing. Uh, so we don't do a hanging cast as common now. Um, as we said, it's a coaptation splint for one or two weeks followed by functional bracing. Um, uh, if you treated the patient non-operative and he developed non-union, uh, the treatment is basically open reduction internal fixation with compression plating um, and uh, grafting, either autograft or allograft, of course, better to use an autograft. So if you have a, a, a non-union after non-operative, uh, the treatment is basically open reduction with compression plating. How to avoid this? Um, uh, studies show that uh, the best indication for future healing is uh, uh, gross motion at the fracture size at six weeks. So if you're treating a patient non-operative and at six weeks uh, you're assessing him and you found that he's still uh, having uh, the fracture motion, gross fracture motion at the fracture side, uh, you should stop uh, non-operative uh, to avoid development of non-union and treat the patient uh, surgically. Uh, we can see here, uh, so this is assessment of the patient. You can see obviously there is a gross uh, motion here. Um, again, we repeat that. So here is the fracture. This is, this is the fracture, and you can yeah. see gross motion here. At six weeks, you should stop non-operative and proceed with surgery. Um, Again, in this patient, uh, we, uh, we yeah. did the surgery for him, intramedullary nailing. Uh, if we have waited, uh, he would have developed non-union and require uh, more extensive surgery with um, uh, plating and bone grafting. Uh, but uh, uh, doing the assessment of the motion allows you to um, uh, uh, better know who, uh, uh, who will develop uh, possible non-union and treat the patient uh, surgically rather than a non-surgical treatment. So this is a patient um, treated non-operatively. Uh, you can see uh, she is here. Even the X-rays is taken with the functional brace on. Patient ended uh, healing perfect. She has full extension, full flexion, uh, and the alignment uh, of her um, extremity looks very good. So this is a patient that was uh, treated uh, non-operatively. So we can see here, this is another patient, gunshot wound, um, uh, treated with external fixator, developed non-union. So the treatment, as we said, was um, uh, open reduction tendon fixation with plate and screws uh, together with bone grafting. Patient ended um, with good healing and colors across the fracture. So we said that most cases of a humerus fracture can actually be treated non-operative. So what are the indications of operative treatment? When, when do we think about operative treatment? Um, the first thing, of course, if you cannot get an adequate reduction with closed treatment, and what do we mean by adequate reduction? Um, actually, the criteria uh, for adequate reduction is very wide in humerus, so you can allow shortening of up to three centimeters, so uh, a little bit more than one inch. Uh, you can uh, allow marked 
amount of rotation 30 degree and you can allow market allowed of angulation up to 20 degree so the the criteria for adequate reduction um, is very easy in in humerus it's uh, shortening up to three centimeters angulation up to 20 and rotation up to 30. Now, uh, if you cannot fall within these criteria you should um, do internal fixation uh, pathological fracture this is indication for internal fixation uh, open fractures um, uh, these uh, should be treated surgically uh, if you have a high velocity gunshot wound also this should be treated surgically um, if there is an associated injury if there is a vascular injury that needs uh, to be treated surgical and if there is a brachial plexus injury this is very important why because the non-operative treatment basically depends on the presence of the muscles and the muscle contraction to maintain uh, the um, uh, alignment of the humerus so if you have a brachial plexus injury uh, that um, in the, uh, will result in a non-functioning muscle around the humerus so the non-operative treatment will not work like you can see in this picture this patient had long time ago um, a brachial plexus injury and he was treated with shoulder um, arthrodesis for that reason then now he developed a humerus fracture so this humerus fracture cannot be treated non-operatively it has to be treated surgically because this patient is lacking muscle power in his arm so you may be given um, uh, uh, this scenario um, uh, a patient uh, uh, had a motorcycle injury a long time ago he developed brachial plexus uh, and now recently uh, he developed uh, a humerus fracture uh, so what is the treatment the treatment is open reduction tendon fixation it is not bracing uh, if you have segmental fracture if you have like a um, proximal and distal humerus because uh, you have a high risk of non-union um, that may develop in one or both sides uh, and um, um, if there are patient related factors like polytrauma if you have a patient with multiple fractures it may be hard to treat them in a uh, uh, in a brace uh, if you have a major chest injury you won't be uh, able to put the coaptation splint uh, and it may be hard to um, tolerate the brace um, if you have a patient with poor compliance uh, sometimes patients with schizophrenia uh, um, they cannot tolerate the brace for a long time um, a patient who cannot uh, tolerate the brace uh, or have indication now for internal fixation um, a very common indication for internal fixation is a patient especially female with big breast uh, because in these cases these patients uh, you will not be able to tolerate the coaptation splint and also the fracture will um, angulate um, because of the uh, 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 breast size uh, acting as a hinge uh, over the fracture side um, if you have floating injury also if you have a fracture of the arm and the forearm both should be treated with open reduction tendon fixation i want to stress here that comminuted fracture even if they have radial palsy uh, 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 whether this radial nerve palsy is before or after the reduction are not indication for surgery so comminuted fracture with radial uh, nerve palsy or without radial nerve palsy and, uh, and with the radial nerve palsy with, uh, before uh, close reduction or even after close reduction none of this is an indication for surgery by itself so we have here uh, this patient this is a, a patient that had uh, transverse fracture of the acetabulum fracture of the uh, femur and a transverse fracture of the humerus so this is a polytrauma so this is an indication uh, for fixation another indication you can see the size of this patient uh, she has a big breast she has big arms she's not able to tolerate uh, the uh, splint you cannot get the splint over her shoulder because of the size so all this is indication for internal fixation here it is uh, on the OR table you can see the size uh, of the arm so trying to get a closed reduction or a coaptation splint or a brace on this arm is nearly impossible so this is indication for fixation she was fixed with intramedullary nail uh, surgical treatment now so what is the surgical option so you decided to treat a patient uh, with um, uh, in internal fixations what are your options so basically you have two options you have uh, uh, the option of intramedullary nail as you can see here or you can have the options of plate and screws as you can see uh, in these two lower pictures um, uh, both um, the treatment are um, acceptable options 
uh, if you want to compare between them, uh, both have uh, similar results regarding union. This is very important. So both of them have a similar result regarding union. I know that some people think that plate has a little bit higher union rate. That's not correct. Both nail and plate have a higher, have similar rates of uh, union. Uh, but uh, the nail has a statistically significant uh, um, instance of shoulder pain. Um, so we know that most of the nails are um, are anti grade, so they go from the shoulder here. So they are um, um, associated with higher instance of shoulder pain. Um, also, intramedullary nail has a higher rate of reoperations compared with the uh, uh, um, with the plate. Remember, both have similar results regarding uh, um, uh, healing, uh, but the nail has a little bit higher. Uh, instance of shoulder pain and uh, re-operations. Um, what is the most common complication of intramedullary nail is, as we said, is shoulder pain. So what is the most common uh, complication of using intramedullary nail for humerus is shoulder pain. Um, uh, remember when you put an intramedullary nail, uh, you lock it with the uh, screws uh, anteroposterior in the distal part. These screws are close to the median nerve and brachial artery and you have to be cautious. Uh, what you should do is you should do a relatively big incision, uh, put two retractors or two homans to make sure uh, that you're protecting the vessels. And when you drill, you have to make sure that there is a sleeve over the drill uh, that goes all the way to the bone. So this is screw here for the locking uh, is very close to the uh, uh, brachial artery and the median nerve. Um, when you apply a plate and screws, it can be applied anteriorly or posteriorly as we're going to see now. Now we're going to speak about a very important topic frequently comes in the exam, which is the relation of the humeral shaft fracture with radial nerve palsy. Uh, so, uh, if you have a radial nerve um, with a closed closed humeral shaft fracture, uh, whether that is uh, the the radial nerve happened at the time of the injury or at the time of the uh, closed reduction or at the time of the post surgery, uh, the treatment is observation for about two to three months. So, um, if there is no indication for uh, uh, is uh, open reduction, the treatment will be as we said before, coaptation splint for one to two weeks, followed by a uh, humeral um, brace. And in this uh, case, you're going to add just a cock up splint for the radial nerve for the wrist. Uh, so um, you may get scenarios like a um, patient with transverse humeral fracture and complete radial nerve palsy. What is the treatment? Uh, if there is no indication for surgical intervention, the, the radial nerve is not an indication. So it will be um, uh, coaptation splint for one to two weeks followed by brace. Uh, remember, these are all closed injury. Um, you may get another uh, scenario, a patient with uh, humeral shaft fracture, uh, intact radial nerve. However, you try to do the close reduction, patient develop radial nerve. The treatment is still the same. Uh, so if you have a, a, a radial nerve uh, that happens, um, radial nerve palsy that happens after the reduction, still the treatment is the same is um, uh, observation, which means that you're going to apply coaptation splint for, for one to two weeks, followed by uh, fracture brace, and you're going to add just the cock up splint for the radial nerve. This also includes the Holstein Lewis lesions, which are this is this is uh, the uh, Holstein Lewis lesion. Uh, it's a spiral uh, distal one third fracture in which the distal part moves uh, laterally. Uh, and uh, previously, we used to say that this is an indication uh, if you get a radial nerve uh, to proceed uh, to uh, uh, open, uh, open reduction nerve fixation, exploration of the radial nerve. Um, however, now the recommendation uh, of the um, Holstein Lewis uh, lesion um, with radial nerve uh, injury is still the same as the treatment is. Um, coaptation splint followed by a fracture brace and observation for the radial nerve. Um, uh, you should not be doing EMG immediately for this or nerve studies immediately for this. Uh, you have to wait um, at least for six weeks because the um, uh, early uh, EMG um, uh, can have uh, wrong results. So you do you wait for six to twelve weeks to get your 
um, uh, uh, EMG study, um, and uh, you do not really interfere before uh, six months. So uh, if you have a patient um, uh, who developed a a radial nerve palsy uh, with humerus uh, fracture, whether uh, post-injury or post-reduction, um, you do the EMG, uh, and uh, uh, at six weeks, there is no signs of recovery. Uh, what is the next step is to observe. Uh, usually, uh, we wait um, uh, at, uh, for about six months before uh, exploration and intervention to give time for the nerve to uh, recover. Uh, the incidence of the radial nerve in cases of a humeral shaft fracture is about 11%. This is uh, uh, um, this instance is doubled in Holstein Lewis lesion. It becomes about 22 percent. Uh, so the um, uh, 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 the instance of uh, radial nerve uh, with um, a closed humeral shaft injury is about 11 percent. However, this is uh, doubled in uh, uh, Holstein Lewis lesion. It becomes about 22 percent. Now let's talk about radial nerve palsy after open reduction fixation. So we said after humeral shaft fractures about 11, after uh, uh, Holstein uh, Lewis lesion, uh, uh, it becomes about 22%. Um, after open reduction of fixation is about 7%. The most important factor in, in the instance is actually the approach. The approach that has the highest instance of radial nerve is not the posterior approach, it's actually the lateral approach. This is one of my patients here, you can see. Um, uh, the radial, this is a lateral approach, um, uh, uh, brachioradialis and the lateral intermuscular symptom. Uh, so uh, in this case, um, uh, the radial nerve is very close um, uh, to uh, your um, uh, approach, is very close to the plate, and, uh, and that's why it has the highest instance of radial nerve palsy. Uh, remember, when you go anterolateral, you will take part of the brachioradialis uh, uh, laterally, and this will protect your um, uh, nerve. Uh, that's why uh, the uh, anterolateral is the lowest um, incidence. Uh, the second incidence after the uh, uh, lateral is the posterior. So the highest incidence lateral, followed by posterior, followed by the anterolateral. Of course, in, in the posterior, uh, we know the nerve comes uh, very close uh, to the plate. Sometimes you have to pass the plate under uh, uh, the nerve uh, and continue fixation above uh, uh, in the upper part of the plate uh, on the other side of the nerve. Uh, so highest instance with lateral followed by posterior followed by anterolateral because anterolateral you take half of the uh, brachioradialis muscle laterally and this will protect your radial nerve. Now I'm going to talk about recovery. Remember 90 to 95% of radial nerve palsy with humeral shaft fracture were recovered. This includes the cases uh, that happens after injury, after reduction, after open reduction. So uh, the vast majority of the cases, the radial nerve will recover. Uh, so is there an indication to explore the radial nerve in case of uh, radial uh, humerus fracture? Yes, if it's an open fracture with radial nerve palsy, in this case, the recommendation is, of course, open reduction, terminal fixation, and radial nerve exploration. Uh, to monitor the recovery, um, if the uh, radial nerve uh, palsy happened at the level of the mid-arm, uh, the um, uh, first muscle to recover that you can clinically detect is the brachioradialis, and the last muscle to recover is the extensor indicus proprius, which will be uh, index extension. Um, uh, so by this, we finish the topic of the humeral nerve with the radial nerve palsy. Now we're going to speak about the extra-articular distal humeral shaft fracture. So uh, this is fracture that happens in the distal humerus. However, they don't extend to uh, the uh, uh, articular surface. And, and these uh, can actually be managed either operative or non-operative. So they still can be managed with functional bracing, or you can do open induction internal fixation. As you can see here, this is one of my patients. Um, the advantage of the operative fixation is, of course, you can get predictable alignment, you can get it anatomical, uh, and you can get the patient uh, quicker to uh, uh, his or her function. However, uh, the risks are uh, nerve injuries, infection, and possible need for reparations, mainly for hardware removal. Uh, functional bracing can uh, be associated with skin problems, uh, and it can, of course, um, have varying degree of angular deformity. It will not come uh, as anatomical as open reduction. Uh, however, uh, the uh, range of motion and the functions are usually excellent. 
Next topic is intraarticular distal humerus fracture. And in this uh, fracture, the fracture line will, is, will extend to the articular cartilage and there in most cases will be comminution. So the best approach for this fracture is usually uh, through a posterior approach. And in this posterior approach, we do olecranon chevron osteotomy. Uh, so we cut the olecranon um, in like a V-shaped um, to facilitate its um, fixation at the end. And this will allow you clearly visualize the articular surface. Uh, there are two um, concepts or methods of fixation, which either uh, we call it 90-90 or perpendicular or uh, 180 or parallel uh, plates. So the 90-90 uh, was common till uh, about five or 10 years ago in which we applied plate posterolateral and a plate medial and the plate medial can either stop here or go all the way down. Now, uh, more commonly, uh, we're using parallel plating or 180 degree plating, which is plate on the medial side as, the, as this uh, side. However, the lateral, uh, posterior lateral plate now is more of a lateral uh, uh, plate. Uh, it means it, it, it's on the lateral border rather than on the posterior lateral. Um, uh, biomechanical studies uh, uh, is showing that uh, this uh, uh, fixation method, um, uh, the parallel plating, is uh, stronger than the 90 degree. So the recent biomechanical studies um, shows that the parallel plating, which is uh, uh, one on the medial border, one on the lateral border, um, is actually a more rigid fixation uh, than the 90-90 uh, uh, plating. That's why uh, more and more uh, surgeons now is shifting to the new concept of parallel plating. Uh, most common um, complication associated with the olecranon osteotomy is symptomatic hardware. We all know that the olecranon is subcutaneous, so any hardware uh, can be filled, and the symptomatic hardware um, is the most common complication of the olecranon osteotomy. Uh, however, the most common complication of the uh, open reduction fixation for the distal articular uh, fracture is basically uh, loss of range of motion or stiffness. Um, and um, if you would like to counsel the patient, uh, uh, again, the, the thing is um, most common complication is loss of some range of motion and loss of some uh, power of flexion about 25 degree. Um, uh, tricep splitting is alternative to electronosiotomy, so we do um, the tricep splitting. We, uh, you, you, you split the triceps and put it, um, uh, uh, peel it on both sides. Um, it will allow visualization. It will be less visualization uh, of the um, uh, articular surface. However, you will avoid the complication of electronosiotomy. Um, now, also uh, uh, another approach that we use is. Um, uh, medial and lateral paratricipital, so we keep the triceps intact and we go uh, on the medial and the lateral side, especially with the parallel plating, um, uh, 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 medial and lateral paratricipital uh, 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 allows uh, application of the plate relatively easier. Uh, so this is an example of one of my patients. Uh, you can see comminuted intraarticular fracture that goes intraarticular um, piece here, uh, pieces here. Also, there is multiple pieces over the posterior lateral here. So we use parallel plating. We put a plate medial and a plate lateral. Uh, there is a small plate here in the posterior lateral part for uh, some of the comminution. However, the main construct is treated with uh, parallel plating, one uh, on the lateral side and one on the medial side. Um, this one was done uh, uh, without uh, olecranon osteotomy. Um, it was done uh, with uh, um, uh, uh, median and lateral paratricipital. Uh, and again, um, uh, the median and lateral paratricipital is becoming more popular now uh, with uh, um, uh, parallel plating. Uh, this is another example of one of my patients, also highly comminuted fracture. It was uh, open uh, type 1. Uh, uh, and then um, uh, one of the most important steps is you have to do is x-ray interaction. So in his in the OR, uh, we pull traction, we get the x-rays. You can see a little bit more now the pieces. 
um, the first step that you do uh, is you connect these two articular pieces together and you apply a cannulated screw. We applied here uh, two four oak cannulated screws to maintain these two pieces together. Uh, and then after that, you apply your fixation. So we put here a medial plate and posterolateral plate. So uh, this is a medial plate. Uh, posterolateral here you can see it in the lateral view here it's on the posterior part and this is the medial plate and this is here the post up obviously this is the 90 uh, 90 uh, uh, plating which is one over the medial surface and one over the posterolateral uh, so both um, provide good fixation um, in the last few years people are shifting more towards uh, parallel plating because um, uh, studies have shown that uh, parallel plating uh, is um, biomechanically more rigid fixation uh, some of the cases of the comminuted distal uh, intraarticular fractures in elderly patient or patient with uh, rheumatoid arthritis uh, and um, uh, long time uh, uh, corticosteroids, they are better treated with total elbow arthroplasty uh, rather than open reduction fixation. Uh, and this is one of the um, uh, concepts that commonly comes in the exam. You'll be given elderly patient uh, with comminuted fracture. What, what is the treatment of uh, choice? It will be a total elbow replacement or a patient with rheumatoid arthritis on chronic steroids um, x-rays show highly comminuted fracture severe osteopenia the treatment is total elbow and remember the uh, goal for the treatment is uh, is always the uh, early range of motion uh, so um, if you have a patient that had open reduction fixation presenting with a stiffness and the x-rays does not show loosening or loss of reduction the treatment will be formal therapy um, for range of motion and also progressive progressive splinting so patient comes and you apply a splint um, uh, that um, uh, increase the amount of extension uh, serially. Now uh, we'll go to the uh, capitellar fracture. Uh, the capitellum is the uh, lateral part of the uh, distal articular uh, surface of the uh, humerus. Um, and the capitellar fracture are um, classified into from one to four. One uh, is um, the uh, broken piece of the capitellum that has uh, bone and cartilage, and this is the one uh, uh, that can be fixed because it has significant amount of subchondral bone. Uh, type two is a small flick of cartilage, minimal subchondral. Type three is highly comminuted. Type four um, uh, is the uh, most common type, and this fracture actually uh, is uh, similar to type one. However, the fracture goes medial to include part of the trochlea. And the X-rays of the uh, capitella fracture for type 4 will show what's called a double bubble. Uh, you can see here this is one bubble and here is the other. So this is one and this is the other. And this double bubble um, uh, indicates that the fracture goes medial to the trochlea. So you have one bubble from the capitellum and one uh, uh, arc is uh, the trochlea. Uh, uh, the treatment for uh, this is internal fixation, open induction internal fixation through lateral approach. Um, and in most cases, you will go anteroposterior uh, uh, using headless screw. Um, if it's type 2 or type 3 with minimal subchondral bone uh, and there is a block for motion, you can, uh, it can be treated with excision of the fracture uh, fragment. The next topic is radial uh, fracture of the radial head. Uh, and the fracture of the radial head is uh, classified into one, two, or three. One is an undisplaced, uh, and in these cases, the treatment is sling and early range of motion. Uh, type two, in which there is uh, two pieces uh, with displacement of two millimeter or more. Uh, and in this case, the treatment depends on the assessment of the stability in the forearm. Um, uh, so you assess the elbow for elbow stability and the forearm rotation. Um, if there is no blockage of rotation, no instability, the treatment is similar to type 1 with early range of motion. If there is a block, the treatment is open reduction tunnel fixation. Uh, sometimes the, if the patient is having too much pain and you cannot uh, uh, adequately assess him or her, the, uh, the, the exam is facilitated by aspiration of the hematoma and injection of uh, lidocaine. Type 3 is a comminuted fracture. Uh, if there is uh, three pieces, you can still try, try open reduction internal fixation um, uh, if possible. Um, uh, however, in most cases, um, the treatment will be either prosthetic replacement, uh, radial head arthroplasty, or excision of the head radius. Um, uh, remember, um, there is few points with internal fixation uh, of uh, the radial head. Uh, during the approach, the approach is posterolateral approach. Uh, 
Um, what we'd like to do is um, keep the uh, forearm pronated because that will push the um, center osseous nerve more anteriorly, so it will be further away from the uh, 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 approach and uh, will protect the nerve. Uh, also, when we apply the fixation, um, you'd like to avoid uh, uh, the areas of the head radius that um, uh, will uh, articulate with the ulna, so it's a 90 degree uh, uh, arc, um, and this 90 degree uh, it can be uh, outlined by the uh, uh, relation to the styloid, uh, radial styloid, and lister tubercle. Uh, so you assist the patient, uh, and the 90 degree that is um, this, uh, aligned with the uh, arc between the radial styloid and the lister tubercle. Uh, it is safe to have a uh, fixation there. Uh, other areas articulate with the ulna and you would like to stay away from that part. Uh, uh, as I said, most of the type 3 will end by either um, excision of the head or prosthetic replacement. This is uh, radial uh, head replacement, and you can see patient has uh, adequate range of motion uh, and uh, flexion and extension. Um, you can see here, uh, this is a highly comminuted olecranon fracture. Uh, however, uh, the radius is, uh, head radius is three pieces. Uh, and this patient was actually uh, treated uh, with uh, open induction tail fixation. Uh, so here is the approach. You can see here is the, uh, the main piece of the radial head. Uh, and uh, this was put back, and uh, after that, internal fixation uh, was applied. Um, again, this internal fixation should be applied into the 90-degree arc uh, that um, is outlined by the uh, Lister tubercle and radial styloid. And then, of course, the ulna fracture was uh, fixed in this case. Uh, so you can see here, the rate, this is the main piece here. So this uh, two main pieces, um, so this is um, a, a type 2 uh, radial uh, fracture. Um, uh, and it was radial head fracture, it was uh, fixed uh, internally, um, and uh, after that, the, ole the olecranon was fixed. Um, uh, in, uh, this is uh, um, uh, another uh, case of uh, uh, proximal ulna fracture, commutated uh, radius. This, in this uh, uh, um, time, we decided to go uh, to arthroplasty, uh, and here the ulna was fixed, and you can see here a, a radial uh, head replacement um, was done. When we do radial head replacement, um, uh, it, we usually go uh, direct lateral rather than posterolateral, um, and this um, it will you will be closer to the posterior osseous. However, uh, it will be more protection of the uh, ulnar uh, uh, radial ulnar collateral ligament. Uh, uh, this is a patient presented actually um, a few days after the injury, highly comminuted radial head. So this piece here actually was open, um, so there was an open wound over this area. So the decision was taken to go for um, radial head excision and not arthroplasty. Uh, so um, again, to summarize type 1 and type 2, uh, the treatment is early range of motion um, and the sling, the, uh, you should not apply splint, uh, just a small sling and, uh, and then the patient can get his hand out and uh, do early range of motion. If, as we said, if the patient is having pain, um, uh, injection of lidocaine uh, um, to control the pain and then reassess. Um, you should do arthroplasty and not excision uh, if there is um, uh, instability of the elbow or if there is interosseous membrane injury, which is called Essex lubristi. In, in these cases, the patient will have uh, wrist pain. So if you have a patient with radial head, you should always inquire about the wrist, if there is wrist pain or not, and, and you should get an x-ray, see if there is proximal migration um, uh, uh, of the radius. Uh, and of course, if there is an elbow instability, you should not do simple excision. Um, uh, both cases that we presented uh, with comminuted uh, um, olecranon, uh, these are cases um, uh, that uh, should be treated with uh, uh, arthroplasty and not simple excision. Um, uh, if you treat um, uh, cases with elbow instability with simple excision, uh, it may lead to uh, elbow instability. And um, uh, if there is a cases of Essex lubristi, uh, uh, that has injury in the osseous membrane and, and wrist pain, and you treat them with simple excision, um, it will lead to uh, proximal uh, migration uh, and uh, chronic wrist pain. Uh, 
Uh, important concept that frequently come in the exam is the assessment of the radial head replacement length. Uh, so when you do the uh, assessment of the length, you'd like to make sure that you're not over stuffing the elbow and not uh, over lengthening the radial um, uh, head. Um, the best way is um, either uh, direct visualization of the lat um, lateral part of the ulnohumeral joint or as in as this picture, this is one of my patients, we take an intraoperative uh, fluoroscopy uh, and assess the uh, lateral part of the ulnohumeral joint making sure that um, this is not uh, um, widely distracted um, because if this is the condition, it indicates that uh, over lengthening of the radial head. Uh, thanks, and I hope this lecture and other lectures are useful for your study and for your uh, clinical work.